Turnberg, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight for this important lecture entitled Beyond the Balfour Declaration, which is part of the National Balfour 100 program. The traditional form of greeting among Jews throughout the world is Shalom Aleichem, peace be upon you. And the reply is Aleichem Shalom, upon you be peace. Other religions share cognates to this greeting. Tonight, we are fortunate to have as our speaker, Lord Leslie Turnberg, who after a distinguished career in medicine, has turned his attention to the thorny problem of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and how peace might be established. Professor of Medicine and Dean of the Faculty in the University of Manchester and President of the Royal College of Physicians in London, he now uses his experience in research and in large organisations to analyse the reasons behind the inability of the Zionists and Arabs to reach a compromise. As a Labour peer, he focuses on the problems that abound in the Middle East in his interventions in debates in the House of Lords. He opened the debate on July the 7th on the Balfour Declaration, in which he asked what plans Her Majesty's Government have to mark the centenary in November, and said that Israel owed an enormous debt to Britain. We are indeed fortunate to have friends like Lord Turnberg speaking up for, for us in Parliament. May I say, as a member of the Board of Deputies, how grateful we are to all the members of the APPG, the all-party parliamentary group on British Jews, who helped to deepen the connections between Parliament and the UK Jewish community. As Jews with a long history of persecution and turbulence, we seek not just peace, but live in hope of a better tomorrow. The national anthem of Israel is Hatikva, the hope. Jewish thought recognizes hope that things will get better, even when we know it may not come to pass as we wish. In the political arena, as well as in our personal lives, we may feel that everything looks bleak and hope an impossible dream, but we must never ever give up hope. To use a meteorological metaphor after yesterday's strange weather, it is always darkest before the dawn. A story doing the rounds at present in political circles is that various international dignitaries and heads of state meet with God and make requests for their people. Donald Trump asks, will there ever be peace between the USA and North Korea? And God says, yes, but not in your lifetime. Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, asks whether the conflict in Syria will ever end, and God says, yes, but not in your lifetime. And Benjamin Netanyahu asks, will there be peace between Israel and its Arab neighbors? And God says, yes, but not in my lifetime. <laughs> Tonight, Lord Turnberg will take us down the road that started 100 years ago, outlining some of the markers and milestones of attempts to negotiate a peace in the Middle East and indicate what a future peace settlement might look like. I have much pleasure in inviting Lord Turnberg to speak on Beyond the Balfour Declaration. Well, thank you very much indeed for that kind introduction and for uh, inviting me to speak to you today. I'm delighted to see so many people here. I thought you'd all be balfoured out by now. Uh, there's so many balfour meetings and balfour talks. And uh, my problem this evening is to try and think of something to say that will keep you uh, glued to your seats. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of the incidentally, of the man who fancied himself as a public speaker who said, uh, my audience is always glued to its seats, and someone said to him, yes, that's a good way of keeping them there. <laughs> well, you'll be relieved to know, perhaps, that I'll not be talking about how Israel should or should not be resolving its conflict with the Palestinians. There are over 8 million Israelis, all of whom have an opinion, all different from each other, and all different from what their government should be doing. And uh, it's the case that my own opinion is dealt with in my book, so you'll have to read my book if you want to find out what that is. What I am going to talk about is what it was that induced Balfour and the British government to support so strongly the establishment of a home for the Jews in Palestine. Why on earth did they spend so much time in the war cabinet at a time when 
Britain was doing terribly badly in the war against Germany. Things were going very badly wrong. And having been so supportive in 1917, why in 1939 did the government issue that notorious white paper that put a block on immigration of the Jews at a time when they needed it most, when they were being killed off in the death camps of Europe? And I'll talk about the Declaration now when there are so many misunderstandings about what its significance was and when there are so many who see it as the biggest error of judgment that a government could make. Uh, I believe the Guardian this morning takes that line. Uh, and there are others, of course, who think it was the most magnanimous gesture of an imperial nation for a persecuted people. And it's pretty clear that Balfour would never have imagined that a hundred years later there would be this continuing conflict over what he described as this small notch of land that the Arabs couldn't possibly begrudge. He would have been amazed and disturbed to hear that the Palestinian Authority is now seeking an apology from the British government for the declaration. Last year, I visited Ramallah. I didn't just go to Ramallah. I took a group of uh, peers, lords, to Israel, uh, mostly not Jewish. And we went to the West Bank, we went to Ramallah, went to the PA offices, and we met a man called Nabil Shaf, who surprised our non-Jewish peers by saying, it's all you Brits' fault for the Balfour Declaration that we're in this mess that we're in. It didn't please our peers, I can tell you, and it was a very good PR move for the Israelis. But going back to the beginning of the 20th century, the hope of the Jews that the Enlightenment in Western Europe would bring them relief was soon shattered as assimilation and even conversion to Christianity failed to curb the growing anti-Semitism which changed from religious persecution to racial persecution. Chaim Weizmann wrote about his German professor in Berlin who told him not to worry because once the Germans recognized the excellent qualities of the Jews, all would be well. He said, a little enlightenment judiciously applied and anti-Semitism would simply vanish. That was in Germany, enough said. Herzl, Theodore Herzl and his colleagues had tried hard to get the Turks to let the Jews into Palestine without any success. So by the time Balfour came along, almost 20 years later, it had become clear to Chaim Weizmann and his colleagues that Britain was where they should focus their efforts. So let me come, finally, what it was that brought the unlikely figure of Balfour to the aid of the Zionists in such a remarkable way. What about the man himself? He was uh, very tall, very thin, languid in appearance, aristocratic in attitude. He would lean on any convenient wall or lie almost flat on the benches in Parliament. He gave the superficial impression of someone who found life all too difficult and is often remembered for saying, nothing much matters and very few things matter at all. Even as a child, he had to have a nap in the afternoon and I can sympathize with that. And his teachers regarded him as fragile, very wealthy. He was more interested in ideas and philosophy and written several books on logic and doubt and everyone was dazzled by his conversation. He never married, but he was attracted by and very attractive to large numbers of women and he had an affair for a long while with a married woman. He was admired by most who knew him for his upright character and moral vision. Winston Churchill described him as having the uplifted mentality of a great pope. Of course, all that was far from the whole story, and there was much more to him, as I'll tell you. Once in Parliament, he wasn't taken too seriously, until he was made Minister for Ireland by the Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury, much to the surprise of all his fellow MPs, until it was realised that Lord Salisbury was his uncle. 
and his real name, Salisbury's real name, was Robert Cecil. And when Bob's your uncle, anything's possible. He went on to become prime minister. Uh, not a very happy experience for him, and he stopped that after about four or five years. Until in 1916, 16, Lloyd George, who was then the prime minister, brought him back into the war cabinet as foreign secretary. So then we're now in 1916, First World War, Lloyd George's war cabinet. The question now is, how come did this highly intellectual paradigm, paragon of virtue, well connected with the aristocracy, come to support the Jews? And there'll be many answers, all but one of which is really the one that's the truth. Was it perhaps the guilt he felt at having passed the Aliens Act, 1904 or 5, which limited in immigration from the uh, Middle from the uh, Eastern Europe, largely of Jews, into what was then a very crowded East End of London. Was it that? Or perhaps it was to repay Weizmann for having developed a method of producing larger quantities of acetone that was used in the manufacture of explosives. It was a very important thing for him to have done. Was it that? Certainly in schools in Israel, they teach them that. Some thought that it was perhaps a way of gaining the support of powerful American Jews in persuading their president to come into the war on the side of the Brits against the Germans. They overestimated the power of Jewish lobbies, as many have done since then. But it was certainly a view at the time. Or was it to make the Germans to stop them persuading the Jews to come in on their side, which they were doing? There was certainly a question also of whether it was strategically important for Britain to have a reliable ally, the Jews, in the Middle East who would fight with them against the Turks. Brits couldn't rely on the disparate Arab groups, many of whom were rather more inclined to side with the Turks than the English. Clearly the Brits needed to have a friendly people in such a vitally important area to protect their oil interests and their route through the Suez Canal to India. That weighed heavily with Prime Minister Lloyd George, and it also influenced a little uh, Balfour. But Balfour's support for the Jews predated all of that. In the mid-1890s, 20 years before, he had uh, considered uh, why the Jews were having such a hard time in, in, the, in Eastern Europe and Russia. And uh, he listened to what he was saying uh, when he was speaking then and later. We cannot forget how they, the Jews, have been treated during long centuries. Our whole religious organization of Europe has proved itself guilty of great crimes against this race. That was Balfour. He didn't believe that uh, Dreyfus in France was, was guilty. He thought that was a French anti-Semitic plot. In 1918, he wrote a remarkable introduction to Nahum Sokolov's book on Zionism, in which he said, the position of the Jews is unique. For them, race, religion, and country are interrelated as they are interrelated in the case of no other race no other religion and no other country on earth. So if you're looking to try and define whether Judaism is a religion, a race, or a nation, go no further than Balfour. So it was these remarkable sentiments and words by Balfour, that great man, that have to be remembered. Even on his deathbed, he told his niece that he looked back on what he'd been able to do for the Jews as the thing most worth his doing. So, what about the declaration itself? You all know what it said, dated November the 2nd, 1917, addressed to Lord Rothschild. It contained the critical sentence that revealed that the British government viewed with favor two interlocking ideas, creation of a home in Palestine for the Jews, together with this proviso that nothing shall be done to prejudice the civil and religious rights of the Palestinian 
population. But there was much more to it than that. And it's clear that the somewhat uh, ambiguous wording was thought out rather carefully. And it came after a lot of debate by Weizmann and his colleagues who submitted their own proposals and by the British government uh, officials who then changed it. First draft by the Zionists included the words, the reconstitution of, uh, of Palestine as the, the Jewish national home. Reconstitution, of course, recognizes the ancient rights of the Jews to the land. But what came out at the other end, after the government modified it, spoke only of the establishment of a Jewish home, not the home. Weizmann tried hard not to frighten the horses by talking about statehood for the Jews. But there was little doubt that Weizmann and even Balfour spoke privately of the declaration leading inevitably to a Jewish state in the fullness of time. And the newspapers soon saw it as such. At that time, the Daily Express headline, A State for the Jews, and the Times blaring Palestine for the Jews left little doubt as to what they saw as the Declaration's meaning. It was greeted, greeted with joy by the Zionists, although it, not much notice was made of it, uh, because it was almost exactly the same time that the Bolshevik Revolution occurred, and that took over a lot of the publicity. Interestingly, as an aside, when uh, Chaim Weizmann was working in Geneva, in 1900 or so, spent his time in a cafe expounding on the uh, virtues of Zionism to groups of students, while across the street, in another cafe, Leon Trotsky, another Jew, was expounding on the virtues of communism. And then in 1917, both of them got their way. Quite an interesting condition. <coughs> Right. Uh, despite the success of the Balfour Declaration, it's pretty clear that it wasn't an official treaty. It had no legal status. It was simply a declaration of sympathy with the Jewish Zionist aspirations, Favor an expression of favorable support for those aspirations, and no thought seems to have been given to how one group, the Jews, were expected to protect the rights of another group, the Arabs, who were intent on killing them off. But of course, to get the agreement of the government wasn't so straightforward. Most members of the cabinet were in favor, including the Prime Minister, Lloyd George. He was a Welshman, small, small country, small state, liked the idea. He remained strongly supportive. It was the Jewish member of the cabinet, Edwin Montague, who violently objected. And he wasn't the only Jew who was vehemently opposed to the Zionists. Even the Rothschilds were split down the middle. So few of the wealthy assimilated Jews saw themselves running off to Palestine to herd sheep and gather olives. Montague used many of the arguments one hears of today. Why should an assimilated Jew, well integrated into society, want a homeland elsewhere. If I'm an Englishman who happens to be a Jew, why do I need it? Wouldn't a Jewish homeland cause more anti-Semitism than already exists? And wouldn't it create more pressure for Jews to leave England? Wouldn't it be much better to encourage better treatment of Jews in countries where they are less privileged than in England? Isn't the whole idea a pipe dream that would create more difficulty for the Arab, Arabs as well as for the Jews. Montague certainly saw himself as first an Englishman and then as a Jew, but that wasn't how others saw him. His friend, he was friendly with the Prime Minister Asquith, who referred to him in somewhat derogatory terms as the Assyrian when he wrote to his muse, Venetia Stanley, he used to write to this woman every day, even in cabinet meetings. He used to write to Venetia Stanley, not his wife, this other woman. Very strange. 
Well, his opinion of Montague as this Assyrian was not improved when Venetia went off and married Montague and converted to Judaism to do it. Well, Montague managed to hold up the decision on Balfour only for a while, and when he was sent off to India as viceroy, the cabinet went ahead and approved it in his absence. It sometimes said that Balfour's declaration was purely a British proposal without international approval. But you need to know that that idea flies in the face of the evidence. It had the written approval of the French Foreign Office, where Nahum Sokolov had worked his charm on the Foreign Minister Jules Cambon, and in Italy, where he persuaded the Prime Minister. He also met the Pope, and the Pope said favorable words too. So Nahum Sokolov was quite a man, an unsung hero of Zionism who did an awful lot of work at that time. The Russians were in favor, as were the Italians, and in America, it eventually had the rather belated support of President Wilson, who uh, supported it. So it clearly had international approval. Um, it's important to know that Britain would not have been able to go ahead without the support of its allies. Uh, it's a point worth noting when all the blame for Israel's creation lands on the back of Balfour. Just tell them that it was an internationally agreed. But that was far from the end of the story. Remember that the declaration had no legal basis, and even though it was an official statement by a government, it was a little more. And we know how difficult little statements are by governments. It could have got lost at any time. And here's the surprise. It wasn't immediately rejected by the Arabs. In fact, Hussein, the Grand Sheriff of Mecca, and his son, Prince Faisal, were generally supportive of Jewish immigration into what they regarded as a far distant and neglected corner of the Arabian lands. Weizmann met Faisal on a number of occasions in what seems to have been very friendly circumstances. There's this famous photograph of the two of them dressed in Arab gowns and a headdress with Weizmann looking faintly embarrassed. And for a while at least, the leaders amongst the Arabs elsewhere went along with Jewish immigration, thinking it might be rather a good thing. Faisal spoke of the two branches of the Semitic family, Arab and Jew, who understood each other. He wrote to Felix Frankfurter in America, the Arabs, especially the educated amongst us, look with deepest sympathy on the Zionist movement. And the De daily newspaper in Mecca wrote in 1918, that the Jews were the original sons of the sacred homeland and welcomed them there as brethren. All that goodwill, of course, towards the Jews was lost when Hussein and his sons realized that they had been cheated in what they thought had been agreed with the British. Grand Sheriff Hussein was persuaded to get his Arab colleagues to revolt against the Turks with a promise of a huge Arab empire stretching from Turkey in the north right down to Egypt in the south, all under his control, he would be king, except for that small notch of land around Palestine that he was happy to allow for the Jews. All that sweetness and light towards the Jews was lost when this secret agreement between the French and the British to carve up the Middle East after the war into their own spheres of influence came to light. Neither the French nor the British trusted the Arabs to rule themselves and were reluctant to even allow them to try in such a strategically important part of the Middle East. So they decided they're going to keep control. And as soon as that came to light after 1917, Hussein and his sons knew they'd been duped. And it was only then that the Jewish influx into Palestine began to be regarded as a symbol of Western colonization. So it's worth emphasizing that the Arab leadership only became incensed after the Middle East was carved up into French and British mandates, and it was Western imperialism, not Jewish immigration, that turned the Arabs against the West. 
And while Palestinian Arabs had always strongly resisted the influx of Jews, the much wider Arab displeasure only emerged when the Jews became the most obvious local symbol of British perfidy. The neat division of Middle Eastern spoils was justified, at least in part, on the fund assumption that this was a magnanimous gesture by imperial nations, and this is a straight quote from the League of Nations, to administer peoples not yet able to stand by themselves under the strenuous conditions of the modern world. There you go. There was this conviction of superiority by the British that meant that they could take charge of less fortunate souls. Hardly wonder that then there was terrible revolts in Syria and Arabia after that. But what of the legal basis of Israel's existence that we all have to face with Israel's opponents? It was at San Remo in 1920 where we move on from a simple expression by the British of viewing with favor a Jewish homeland to a much more significant internationally agreed recognition of Jewish rights in Palestine. And here again, Arthur Balfour was busy weaving his ideas of support for the Zionists into the fabric of the agreements. It's there in San Remo, the agreement for the Jews was formalized. And instead of simply viewing with favor, Britain was mandated to provide a Jewish home in Palestine. And furthermore, it was the first time that the idea of a Jewish nation, mentioned over 20 times, was put into the words of an international agreement. And the word reconstitution, rather than establishment of a home for the Jews, also appeared, pointing to historical rights for Jews in Palestine. And it was that agreement that was put up for full international approval two years later in the newly formed League of Nations, when all 51 nations voted for it and none against. Well, let me just say a few words about Weizmann, clearly a, a towering figure alongside Herzl and Ben-Gurion in Israel's foundation. He was not only largely instrumental in persuading Balfour and the British government to produce the declaration, he ran around the world persuading everyone else to support it thereafter. He worked behind the scenes in San Remo. He was in Geneva, pulling every string he could to get the League of Nations to sign up. And much later, at the UN, when they accepted the League's agreement, he personally worked on President Truman, who was then the president after the war, after World War II, to accept the Jewish state, when all Truman's advisers were telling him not to do it. And he also convinced Truman to include the Negev Desert in the partition plan. It wasn't included before that. He told him that he should, and he did. So here was the international diplomat who made it happen. So it bothers me as a fellow Mancunian, he was a Mancunian by then, that he so little regarded within Israel for his achievements. The reasons are not too hard to understand, because by the 1930s and later, Britain began to behave badly towards the Jews and had closed the doors on immigration in the vain hope of placating the Arabs. The Jews began to regard the Brits as the enemy, and a much more muscular, aggressive approach was needed against them. And men like Ben-Gurion and Menachem Begin were needed to engage in armed resistance. Weizmann's pro-British negotiating tactics went out of fashion. And Ben-Gurion and he didn't get on, disagreeing about everything. Weizmann mentions Ben-Gurion only once in his biography and then right near the very end. The history of Zionism is littered with vicious internal warfare. It's amazing they managed to get anything done. But then in the 1920s and 30s, with Balfour and Lord George gone, the attitude in Britain changed. Palestinian Arabs rose against both the Jews and the Brits in a series of riots, 1920, 1921, most seriously, 1929. The riots saw many Jews and Arabs killed or injured, and the British government responded 
by restricting Jewish immigration. A series of government commissions, reports followed in the report of 1929 is clear from the evidence that was described that the Arabs were the cause of the riots and that the main instigator was that rabid anti-Semite, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Husseini. But then in the classic tradition, the blame was placed on the victims. It was Jewish immigration that caused the riots, so immigration should be reduced, and since the land available to the Jews was too small to take them, they should be stopped from buying any more. The, the one saving grace in all of that, this whole sordid affair, is that one of the members of the commission, an MP called Henry Snell, saw through the distortions. And if you read the report, he has put in a minority report in which he saw through the whole thing and s said, this is entirely wrong. The blame is with the Arabs, not the Jews. And he, so the, he was a great man, Henry Snell. He became quite interested in the Zionist cause. But the nastiest deed by the Brits, and the one that had the most profound, serious impact, came with the notorious white paper of 1939. And that was the vain attempt to placate the Arabs again. Britain shut the door on immigration at the exact moment when the Jews needed to escape from the death camps of Europe. It was that white paper that saw millions of Jews perish in gas chambers, caused the Jews of Palestine and later of Israel to lose all faith that they had gained from Balfour and his declaration. Menachem Begin likened the Brits to Hitler and the Gestapo and had no compunction in fighting back with any aggressive tactics he could muster. Ben-Gurion, as you all know, famously said, we will fight the white paper as if there is no war, and the war as if there is no white paper. Even after the war, when Ernest Bevin became the Labour Party's foreign secretary, restrictions on immigration continued, and he fought tooth and nail to try to prevent the UN from accepting the resolution that opened the way for Israel to be created. That too did not very much to encourage love for Britain and by the Israelis. But there's little doubt that without Balfour's declaration, the Jews would have had a very hard time getting a state of their own. And whatever Britain did later, before, during, immediately after the Second World War, to try to restrict immigration and to reduce the size of the promised land in various partition plans, one after the other. There's no getting away from the absolutely essential role that Britain played in 1917, 1920, and 1922. And even though the promised land was nibbled away bit by bit in partition after partition, it was Ben-Gurion writing to his son from his house in London did you know there's a blue plaque on Ben Gorion's house in Maida Vale? It's quite an interesting one. He said to his son that the Jews should accept what was on offer, the almost indefensible sliver of land that was being offered, knowing full well that they'd be able to change facts on the ground in due course. And against all the odds, that, of course, is what they managed to achieve. But it's not only Israel that should be grateful Britain, too, should be grateful. Britain should celebrate the fact that it provided the foundations of a democratic state in a part of the world where democracy was and remains very short supply. I like to think that despite the difficulties that have to be overcome, if the Israelis and Palestinians are ever to reach a peaceful solution, Britain should celebrate a democracy where religious and ethnic differences are fully tolerated, the only Middle East state where the number of Christians is rising, where gay parades are a feature of life, where the uh, British ambassador mounted a float on the recent gay parade in Tel Aviv. 17 members of the Knesset are Arabs, Supreme Court judge, academics, doctors, professionals, and so on, are all Arabs, as I'm sure you know. Britain should be proud of what it started, and now more than ever, it needs Israel's cooperation in security, 
cybersecurity and trade. People now ask me what I think are the prospects for a solution to the current standoff between Israelis and Palestinians who are so far apart, as if I know. But it is fascinating to see that a hundred years after Britain set the ball rolling for a Jewish state in the Middle East, now, at long last, the more pragmatic Arab states, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Gulf states, Jordan, are showing signs that they, after a hundred years, might be willing to accept a Jewish state too. That, of course, all depends on Mr. Abbas recognizing a Jewish state and perhaps Mr. Netanyahu curtailing his West Bank expansionist plans. Everyone knows there are enormous advantages to everyone to be gained from a peace deal. Will it happen soon? Highly unlikely. Will it take new and braver leaders on both sides? Almost certainly. Is it worth all the effort? Definitely. Thank you very much. <laughs> Happy to answer questions. Thank you, Pelton. Um, just one question on timing. You said that all 50 nations supported uh, the um, mandate at San Remo? No, no it, League of Nations. League of Nations, I beg your pardon. Um, was that before the Arabs realised they'd been betrayed by Britain then? It was about the same time. It was 1922 when 51 nations of the League of Nations voted in favour of the mandate. Uh, it was about that time. The, the, the Arabs were busily trying to lobby the British Parliament to uh, not allow the mandate to go forward and to not allow the mandate for Palestine at least to go forward for the Jews. So it was about the same time. They'd already begun agitating against it. None of them were part of 51? No, none of them were members of the United Nations because those nations weren't, weren't actually created. They weren't there. It was one big Arabia. <laughs> Syria and Arabia. Good evening. Thank you very much for your speech. We were indeed glued to our seats. Um, my name is Jonathan Taylor. Um, isn't it true that you mentioned that King Faisal uh, was really regarding the sliver of land as a backwater in the Middle East as a whole, and that actually they were more antagonistic to the British uh, failure to define them as states in the way they wanted and give them independence, rather than the antagonism against the Jews. And is it true that, in fact, the Arabs were attracted to the Zionist enterprise because they had labor and they had a chance to settle in a land which previously wasn't uh, fit for settlement after malarial swamps were cleared, etc.? Isn't that true, that, that that brought the Arabs into Palestine rather than Palestinian uh, so-called national uh, aspirations? Certainly Arabs emigrated into, from other countries into uh, Palestine as the Jews came on, uh, came in. But it's, and, and it's certainly the case that Faisal and his father Hussein were supportive initially of Zionists coming into uh, Palestine. Uh, they, uh, Faisal himself was desperate to take over the rule of Syria and the French had designs on Syria, in fact they put it under their own mandate and chucked him out. But Faisal thought the Zionists work on the Brits to stop the French taking over Syria. So it was a bit of intrigue there. He was hoping that the Zionists would help keep the French out of Syria and he could then rule. That didn't happen. But it was always the case that the Palestinian Arabs, the ones that lived there, were against Jewish immigration from the very beginning. Hi, Anthony Blake. Um, I'd like to thank you very much indeed for your very enlightening talk. I'd like to bring it up to date, as it were, and not to say something which perhaps might be too political. But I do note your position in the House of Lords as a Labour peer. And 
without putting too fine a point on it, I think a lot of us here, not that I can speak for everybody here, are very concerned about the antipathy, and that's being very polite, I suppose, and euphemistically, uh, towards the Israel and, in fact, Judy, Jews here, um, which has been, I suppose, the example has been set by the leader of the Labour Party and Jeremy Corbyn, who specifically makes the point of not saying anything pro-Jewish because he might be disturbing his Hamas friends. Well, you, you've got my Achilles heel. I'm a member of the Labour Party, yeah. and I'll have to bear that uh, in mind. Uh, the question, you're absolutely right. Uh, from my own angle, Jeremy Corbyn is a disaster for the Labour Party as it would be a disaster for the country and he'd be a disaster for Israel. So uh, I have no truck with uh, the leader of our party. The question then arises, what, what should I do about it? Uh, should I resign from the Labour Party? And uh, it, it bears thinking about. Um, there are a number of difficulties with that. Some of my colleagues have actually resigned from the Labour Party, uh, only one Jew so far as I know. Um, and it's certainly tempting. The problem is, Corbyn is not going to be there forever. With a bit of luck, we'll get him out. Have I got more influence on the Labour Party being a member in the House of Lords than being on the crossbench? The experience of one of my colleagues who left and went on to the crossbench is that he now feels very isolated and not able to influence anything. So for the moment I'm staying where I am and trying my best to work from within. Uh, but it isn't a comfortable position. You're absolutely right. I can't say I'm very happy with it. I'm fortunate that and I'm in the House of Lords for a number of reasons. One is most of the members of the Labour Party in the House of Lords don't like Corbyn at all, non-Jews as well as Jews. They think he's not the man to lead the country. It would be dangerous. Uh, most of the peers in the Labour Party are much more centrist than not. Uh, so it's a difficult time. Uh, we, I mean, I can't stand uh, the Tory party either. And at the moment, they're in complete disarray. And I just hope that they don't lose their way completely to allow Corbyn in. Difficult times. Shula Arnhem, um, if the Balfour Declaration was meant to offer a homeland to the Jewish people, um, why did it fit in 1940 when the White Paper, when the British mandate or British government um, uh, signed or, or the White Paper to prevent Jews uh, from which was their most um, uh, difficult time in the history of the Jewish people? And um, so hundreds and thousands of Jews perished, maybe millions perished because they weren't allowed. Um, uh, so I feel that the British government was complicit in the murder of millions of Jews and many, most, many of my family. Um, so what was the Balfour Declaration for? I mean, I just feel it failed the Jewish people. Yeah, well, Britain... What was it for? Well, it actually gave the legal basis eventually of the State of Israel. But it, 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 it's certainly the case that Britain reneged on its promises made in the Balfour Declaration. Uh, they backtracked and tried very hard to overturn it unsuccessfully, fortunately for Israel, because it eventually came through from the League of Nations to the United Nations uh, after the war. Uh, but Britain behaved very badly. You're absolutely right. Uh, they changed completely. And the, the reasons were entirely to do with keeping the Arabs on side and making sure the oil. So it was pragmatic and pra practical. Uh, but it was very nasty. You're, you're absolutely right. They behaved very badly. Israel's, Isra Israelis, by and large, have never trusted the Brits since. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> Before I married, I lived in the West End of London and mainly worked there. I remember particularly my father, bless him, telling me once when we were near Southampton Row that the JNF offices were there between Southampton Row and the British Museum. 
and on the side of the JNF offices there was a balcony. And he told me that the Balfour Declaration was read there mm -hmm. to a crowd of Jewish people below. <laughs> and any time I went past the British Museum, I always used to look up the balcony and think of that. Yeah. I, I didn't know that. I'd, I'd like to see where the balcony is. I'm going to have a look next time on that area. Eric Rendell. Um, there is something that a number of people in, who've come into this country from parts, former parts of the British Empire have said about the British that I, I have spoken to, and that is the British um, controlled their empire by the maxim of divide and conquer. Were they not doing the same thing with the Arabs and the Jews in the time of the First World War? I don't think that was the case. I don't think they were trying to divide the Arabs and the Jews uh, in order to conquer them. There were lots of motivation behind uh, trying to, uh, on the one hand, <laughs> Lloyd George was Machiavellian. First of all, he helped the Jews with the Balfour Declaration. Then he was talking to Hussein and his son to try and keep them on board. And he was also trying to make peace with, secretly, with the Turks. So if he'd made peace with the Turks early, he would have left them with their Arabian lands, their Ottoman Empire. And neither the Jews nor the Arabs would have got what they wanted. So he was playing, certainly playing fast and loose with promising everything to all of them. So he was a tricky customer. Um, but I don't, I don't know whether he was playing one off against the other. He was just promising everything to everyone. Good evening. Thank you very much for the most interesting talk. Um, my name is David Roskin. I'm interested to know, uh, as a parliamentarian, you have a, a view across all the spectrum of parliament. Uh, how is it viewed today, uh, the Balfour Declaration, uh, as what it led to? Is it viewed with dismay? amongst the parties? Is there support uh, and um, uh, uh, acceptance of it? And what is being done to mark the 100th anniversary of this uh, wonderful declaration in Parliament itself? And as Tony Blake mentioned earlier on, uh, the Labour leader can't even bring his, himself to mention the name of Israel. So, uh, you know, obviously the, there is a uh, amongst the higher echelons of the Labour shadow cabinet, a great dismay, obviously, of the Balfour Declaration. So is, is there a, um, a greater percentage of parliamentarians, whether they be commons or lords, um, view the Balfour Declaration with favour or dismay? And is there anything being done to um, recognize the 100th anniversary? Well, there, there does seem to be, first of all, there's a fair deal of ignorance and uh, misunderstanding about what the Balfour Declaration was and is and what its representation was. People think it was all Britain when, in fact, it was had to be agreed by uh, the Allies at the time and it had international approval. But leaving that aside, the sense in the Lords is quite different from the sense in the Commons. And the Lords is now a much more friendly pace towards Israel than it was even five years ago, certainly ten years ago. And the reason is because we've been working hard on trying to gather uh, friends. We now have uh, four individuals who are the steering group. Myself on the Labour bench. Uh, Howard Lee on the Tory bench, Ruth Deitch on the cross bench, and Monroe Palmer on the Liberal Democrats. And the four of us meet regularly, and we have now engaged about 90 peers who are supportive of Israel. We take groups of them to Israel, have taken two groups so far, another one this year, uh, and we introduce them to the idea about what Israel is for. And it seems to be working because in July, as I think uh, we heard earlier, that we had a debate that I introduced uh, on something about uh, how will the British government mark the Balfour Declaration. 
And we had, it was only an hour and a half debate, that's all we could get. We, it was only an hour at the beginning, but then because 31 speakers put their name down, they had to increase it to an hour and a half. Well, I had 10 minutes at the beginning and all the rest had two minutes each, including the chief rabbi, uh, the ex-chief rabbi, Lord Sachs came, came in. And uh, of the 30 speakers, 24 were very favorably supportive of Israel. Most of them were our colleagues that we'd enlisted in our system. And there were two or three who spoke against, but they were vastly outnumbered. Now, whether that represents the opinion across the whole house is another matter, but it certainly it was very heartening to hear them. And to read the debate, it's very good. You can get it on Hansard if you go online. Um, the Commons is a different kettle of fish. I think the Commons is much less organized there's rather less Jewish peers than there are Jewish members of the parliament than there are Jewish peers. And I think they have a harder time, the Jewish members of parliament, than we do in the Lords. Um, when we asked the minister who was responding on behalf of the government uh, how they were going to market, she said, we will market with pride. So... And that's what the Prime Minister has actually said. We're going to mark it with pride. And as you probably know, there's going to be a dinner with uh, Netanyahu and uh, Mrs. May and a variety of others uh, in November. I don't know whether that answers you. It, it's two-handed. And I'd like to call on Professor Irving Taylor to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, Spencer. It's my great uh, pleasure and privilege uh, to propose this vote of thanks to our very eminent speaker, Lord Turnberg, although his true title is Baron Turnberg of Cheadle in the county of Cheshire. I prefer to call you Les. Le Les and I have known each other for over 40 years. I don't know whether you remember Les, our first meeting, which was uh, where we were members of a very prestigious club called the M62 Club. You were working in Manchester and I was in Liverpool. It was a fun place and it was a fun club. Uh, not the sort of clubs you're sort of thinking about. <laughs> Les, it's been an excellent talk. You've uh, educated us and provided us with a masterly erudition of a very difficult, of a very complex uh, subject, but you've explained it so clearly. And I think we now begin to understand the personalities who were involved, not only Balfour himself, but all the personalities that were involved in the post-Balfour uh, era. I think I ought to just reiterate something that Spencer said earlier on. I think, when I look back, I think there are very few individuals who have made greater contributions to British medicine over the last 40 years than Les Turnberg. Not only, as we've heard, as a professor of medicine, a dean of a medical school, a president of the Royal College of Physicians, but also as a Labour peer. And it's in this latter capacity that you're continuing to make enormous contributions. You debates on all topics related to medicine, medical ethics, research, problems with the funding of the NHS. But as we've also heard, when it comes to any debate, any discussion taking place in the House of Lords related to Israel, related to the Middle East, uh, then your comments are looked forward to and are greatly appreciated. And I think this is why your contributions con have continued over, over many, many years. And I think we're all extremely grateful to you for not only being a great supporter of Israel, but continuing to support Israel in the powers, amongst the powers that be. Uh, I've actually, you mentioned your book, and I, you haven't actually mentioned that it's at the back of the room to be signed if anybody wants to purchase one. I've actually read the book, uh, and it is absolutely outstanding. It's full of information. Um, I was awestruck because it, it's got so much data in there, uh, and it just shows that even though you were a physician, you're still able to take medical research into the workplace and acquire all these different bits of information, many of it primary source information, distill it out, uh, integrate it, uh, and provide an in a beautiful analysis of the present situation. And certainly, it is a book worth reading. Finally, I, I think I should also mention that... Um, 
Les and his wife Edna um, are also have set up a uh, traveling fellowship, uh, the Daniel Turnberg Traveling Fellowship, in the name of his late son, Daniel. Uh, and this is a, a wonderful initiative in which um, biomedical researchers from throughout the Middle East are able to come to the United Kingdom, to institutes within the United Kingdom, uh, and contribute and take back information that they've acquired. The research is often well peer-reviewed, uh, and it's a way in which the Middle Eastern and the UK uh, uh, departments and institutions can contribute in a well worthwhile way. And it's not only Israelis that are involved. Uh, there have been Egyptians, Jordanians, I think even people from the Palestinian territories have come over. And I think there's over 200 individuals have participated in it so far. And this is a great, uh, again, a great aspect uh, of your overall work towards uh, bringing together an understanding of the Middle East uh, and how it partakes uh, in modern days. So finally, Les, once again, we thank you most sincerely. It has actually been an exceptional talk, and we're most grateful. And it gives me great pleasure, on, really, on behalf of Edgware United Synagogue, to make a couple of donations. I've got a couple of uh, 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 presentations to you. The first, um, one of the many charities which you support, I think there's a whole list of charities you support, but this is a a presentation for secondary first, seeking a cure for secondary breast cancer. This is to record that Edgeway United Synagogue has made a generous donation in support of our work in the field of research into secondary breast cancer in the name of the Lord Turnberg of Cheadle in appreciation of his delivering a lecture as part of the UK's Balfour 100 program, 17th of October, 2017. And also, and also, we are actually in a shul, so I thought you'd need a bit of spiritual encouragement as well. And a rather, and I can tell you, a very good bottle of whiskey. I'm sure it'll go down very well. We don't have whiskey at the back of the hall, but we do have refreshments um, for those who attended. Uh, and thank you all for coming, and please come to our next session. On Tuesday, the 21st of November, will be the lottery-funded London Jews in the First World War. We were there too. We have fascinating stories about Jews all over London, both civilians and the military, and you're invited to bring stories about your family and any memorabilia, and that will be recorded by, by the people who, who are administering uh, this project. So Tuesday, 22nd of November, is the next session on London Jews in the First World War.